works for ah, recording is in progress. Good. Um, uh, thanks also for the organizers, of course, again, for, for organizing this online, which uh, I mean, while maybe not the standard form, very still very enjoyable, of course. Um, so as already mentioned, this is joint work with John Krivin and uh, Russ Hammer. Um, and so I, I thought maybe that the best thing to start with is, is, is to give a quick motivation. And if you are in our community and you have read any of the works on double push out writing, the story always goes like this. You have a span. I write them from right to left. <laughs> That's over the last seven years. We'll keep doing so. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so the point is you, you, you always read, you, you have some category, you have some spans in it, and then some objects and you want to write them. And then immediately you come to a problem because it said these rules at least have to have uh, at least have to be input linear. And the reason is that you want to construct for double push out of writing push out complement. And usually it's said, well, you can't do anything if uh, the top morphism right, the, the I is not uh, linear. As I will show you in this talk, one of the interesting outcomes of our work was that actually there is a universal categorical construction we call multi push out complement. Um, which permits you to proceed even if the rules are left nonlinear or, or input nonlinear. And then, uh, of course, the second part of the story is just taking a push out. So this is sort of the modified generalized version of double push out writing in the case of fully generic rules. Um, and I give you just a quick example, and this is something I learned from a talk by Maxim Konsevich at ERCS a few years back, because mathematicians use this type of writing, it turns out. Of course, they don't use double push out of writing that explicitly. But the idea is here you have a rule which takes the vertex, clones it, and then adds another edge. And the semantics of uh, generalized double push out is that you, you pick a vertex in the graph, it has some incident uh, edges and outgoing edges. And then in the, in the first step in the multi push out complement, so there is a set of possible push out complements, and each of those uh, is effectively a partition of the edges. Um, to the clone vertices, yes? So as, as demonstrated here, some of the ingoing edges of the original vertex get partitioned to the first, some up to the seconds, and similarly for the outgoing edges. And then you insert, uh, I mean, this particular rule then inserts an edge during the push-out phase, which the push-out phase is again the same as usual. And this gives, of course, a very interesting semantics because if you play the game, you start from just the vertex and apply this particular clone and then add an edge rule, in the first step, you just get an edge. In the second step, you get all the sort of uh, linear graphs. In the third step, you see you get linear graphs and sort of these triangle shaped things, and there are some combinatorial factors. And as you see, this, these are just a few steps. This immediately gets extremely complicated because you typically have many push out complements. Um, and so then, of course, the desire is to attack this, this uh, compositional writing theory. So we want to have a concurrency theorem to be able to statically reason about, for example, sequences of writing steps. And then the second motivation of this work was, well, in sesqui push out writing situation is better. You can just simply out of the box, as in the original sesqui work with nonlinear rules. And I just wanted to show the same rule applied now in sesqui semantics will actually just make an edge and then in, in two possible ways, give the two isomorphic um, depictions of the of the three simple uh, sorry two simplex or the oriented two simplex, and then in three different ways you can get from there to to the oriented three simple sets and so on. So in this case, it's a highly symmetric rule. Weirdly, um, of course, then again, one would like to reason about this statically and, and look at the concurrency theorem, and one should say Sesky push out. Concurrency theorem for linear case, I introduced it two years ago. For nonlinear case, there was no such theorem. And it turns out this will take an enormous amount of work. Um, and I mean, there will be quite some technicalities and I'll sketch them in this talk. And then the third motivation is really funny because I mean, uh, working in this field and I, I work a lot with these chemical graph writing systems and, they, and in many other scenarios, you need simple graphs. And the weird thing is, uh, while double push out writing is best formulated over something like an adhesive or an adhesive category, um, if you try to do that with simple graphs, you are technically bound to rules that cannot even create a, a link between two existing vertices. Because if you go in simple graphs and um, treat it as an M adhesive category, you would have to take M the regular models, and these are edge reflecting. So you couldn't even express a matching or uh, sorry, matching you could express, but you couldn't express the linking of, of vertices. And so it turns out in order to do, get like a simple graph of writing, which really is implementing what you would expect it would, and actually being able to express even the simplest 
interesting rules, you actually need to consider it as a linear, nonlinear uh, semantics, in the sense that the rules in the, in the, the spans that encode the rules actually will have to have uh, maps that are not regular monos, otherwise it's not very interesting. And we can do this now. So these are the three motivations of which certainly the last one is a bit of an oddity. And so what I will show you in this talk, and this is a, of course a run, run through of a quite dense paper, but um, so it turns out quasi topoi are a surprisingly natural setting to do this generalized nonlinear writing theory in both double pushdown and Sasky pushdown writing. There are some certain prerequisites in order to even formulate the semantics of either type of writing. Um, and those will be developed in, uh, we're developed in our paper too. And then I'll show you, of course, the nonlinear DPO, in particular the nonlinear Sasky pushdown writing, and give some conclusions and outlook. Okay. So if you look at the literature, and, and this is a rich literature, I want to say, I mean, this is a very well developed, developed topic in mathematics. Um, and in our community, there was this paper by, by uh, Paul Fubushinsky together even with uh, Johnson, one of the, the, the very famous mathematicians in this field. If you look at this definition, it looks rather boring. It's like some categories of quasi topos it has all finite limits and cold limits, it's locally Cartesian close and has this regular sub-object classifier. Now, this doesn't look particularly interesting to our community, but then one can show that it has an enormous number of interesting sort of follow-up properties, and each of those can be shown. Um, I, I won't go into detail here because most of the topics will be touched up on the following slides, but I just quickly wanted to mention, so as said before, quasi top A are M adhesive categories for M the class of regular monos. This is rarely interesting because this is too restrictive because you would have to formulate your rules as a uh, span of uh, um, M monos. But um, then on top, it has all of these interesting processes, passion map classifiers. Um, in particular, it is R regular mono quasi adhesive, which means you have all the required pushouts you need for formulating double pushout, for example, and it has uh, the interesting pullbacks and so forth. Turns out it also has all final pullout, pushout complement, sorry, final pullback complements, um, and some good factorization system. That I, I'll highlight in the following exactly these properties. So, but quickly to say uh, the two running examples of the paper as well as of the talk. Uh, of course, our very standard um, category of directed multigraphs formulated as a pre sheaf topo. So, particular, these are quasi topi. Uh, these are just uh, the, the standard thing. You have edges and vertices. You can have multiple edges between two vertices and so forth. The, the slightly less known variant is simple graphs, simple directed graphs, which can have a loop at a vertex at most. Um, and the interesting bit is that, I mean, there's some quite nice technical construction by Pavel and his colleagues um, formulating this as some, by art and gluing. I mean, they have a mechanism of telling you which nice uh, constructions that exist for quasi topoid of which many are used in computer science. But particular simple graphs are just coded as a set of vertices, set of edges, and each edge has uh, endpoints. And by saying that this map from edges to its endpoints has to be injective, you make sure there's at most one edge in one direct in a given direction between two vertices. And then you have morphisms that simply have to um, have to have to be compatible with this data. It's an edge and vertex mapping which has to be compatible with this data. And so I just quickly give I mean this is nothing complicated. Here is this data again for one particular simple graph edge set, vertex set, and then this delta is this diagonal functor. And then a, a, a morphism is nothing but a commutative diagram of the shape. Um, but here is an interesting point. So the first little bit of, of uh, sort of things, on, I should say I'm, I'm fascinated by how natural quasi topi are for this, because if you go into M adhesive categories, you have to work extremely hard to extract the properties you need for writing. It's a lot of work. Well, here you get many of those more or less for free. It's a very nice setting. So for example, you know in set, you have uh, epimono factorization. So you can do epimono factorization of the vertex mapping in such a morphism. Uh, this gives you a diagram like here, right? because I mean, delta is a functor, you can apply this to this factorization. Um, and now the interesting point is if you take a pullback in the square marked star, then by universal property there exists this dash morphism. And now this has produced you uh, a factorization. So each column, so to speak, is, is, is one uh, such simple graph morphism. And the interesting bit is that the right side describes what's called the regular monomorphism. And so it's by construction edge reflecting. 
And you see that every morphism can be factored into an edge reflecting one and this first one. And so it turns out you can prove that in, in simple graph, the morphism is epi or mono if it's so on the vertices. So you see here, the left guy is an epimorphism, the right column is mon a regular monomorphism. But the interesting bit is that unlike in graph where every morphism, monomorphism is regular, in simple graph, you can be a monomorphism that is not regular, simply because you can write uh, a square where the star thing would not be a pullback. And so that has very interesting properties, which will be mentioned later also in the talk. Okay. But um, one of the most important features of a quasi-topos is um, that it admits um, a partial map classifier. Um, so I have to briefly tell you, first of all, what's um, stable system of monics. So, uh, and, and I mean, of course, we will always use regular monomorphisms for this class uh, or, or monomorphisms in, in the adhesive case. So um, basically, it's, it's a system of monics is stable if it's uh, stable under composition. If it's stable under pullbacks in particular that we need in, in the concurrency system, um, but it is also including all the isomorphisms and so forth. Okay, and um, now what's the partial map classifier? Um, so the idea is that you you, you give a functor t um, and uh, over this category, and you give a natural transformation from the identity to t such that for any x, you of course have this natural transformation from x to tx, but that should be uh, in your class M. Um, and then the second point is much more importantly, um, this weird property that if you have a span uh, of which the left leg is in your class M and the right leg is arbitrary, then you can close this diagram in a particular form uh, so, so that uh, basically if you apply to B, the, 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 the T, uh, then you can close the thing into a pullback diagram. And so this looks like an oddly technical condition, but uh, I'll immediately show you what it's used for. So the idea is you can construct final pullback complements with this. So just a quick recap, a final pullback complement is a categorical construction. It's a special type of commutative square, which first of all is pullback, but it has this universal property that whenever you take uh, uh, on the top, a morphism from X into A, um, and such that this whole thing commutes, uh, A after X is um, this commutative triangle there. And then if the outer square is a pullback, then there exists um, a, a morphism, the dashed one, um, such that you get two pullback squares. And moreover, there is certain universality in this object C, so up to ISO. And now again, so why do we need partial map classifier? The idea is here, you have a generic morphism F and the regular monomorphism M. And now applying this T uh, property, namely the, the bottom right square, that's a special type of pullback where uh, you simply take the morphism M and uh, identity of B, and then they close this whole thing into a particular pullback square. And now um, because T is a functor, you can apply it to F, you get this uh, particular square here. And now all you have to do is take a pullback at the bottom. Um, by universal property, you, you get this top square. And now the fantastic feature is, is that this square is then a final pullback complement. And so the, the message here from a purely constructive point of view is that you give me a quasi topos It has this uh, regular partial map classifier. So you immediately know it has all of these final pullback complements because F is completely generic and M has to be a regular monomorphism. So the good thing, the good news is you don't have to search deep into mathematics to find out oh, which category supports these particular final pullback constructions, any quasi topos will do. That's one of the very important features of quasi topi. And so this is of course well known, this was in our community um, discussed by Andrea Copardini, of course, mathematics community. You find this in any book on quasi topoi. But um, it turns out that in a much similar vein, uh, the properties of quasi topoi permit to construct a two, a three more constructions that are useful for uh, nonlinear writing actually necessary. Um, and so the first one is this famous, uh, <laughs> this advertised um, multi push out complement. So the idea is we are in a, um, in a category with M partial map plus pair. Um, and, and, and we, we formulate a multi push out complement for situations where the horizontal arrow is any, any arrow you like. And the vertical one is, uh, well, in this stable system, one X M. So in our case, typically regular monos. And so the idea is you look, first of all, you define this thing as the set of all possible such, or, or possibly class of all such 
push out squares, um, basically the fillings of this into community square, which um, uh, push out by, by properties of stability, the, the uh, left, the vertical arrow also has to be in the class N, of course. So this is just an abstract definition. But now in order to fill it with life, I have to tell you what are its universal properties and how it is constructed actually. So um, firstly, and, and this is really important for the concurrency theorem later, um, this is a universal property of such multi pushout complements. The statement is whenever you have such an outer diagram, which is a push out, and whenever the, the, the right vertical uh, morphism factors into two M morphisms, then there exists um, up to unique isomorphism, um, such a filling, such that one is an element of the multi push out complement. So essentially, multi push out complement uh, admit a certain type of factorization of push outs. Much like in the final pullback complement, you had this sort of, it's not really the dual thing, but I mean, you had sort of also an arrangement where the final pullback complement splits pullbacks a certain way. And now the construction, um, strangely enough, again, uses M partial map classifiers. And so that was the good news because uh, this week we have available in quasi top I. So here's the idea. So we want to construct the multi push out complement. So the set of, or the class of possible push out complements up to ISO. Um, so F and M are the givens. Now, of course, as we saw before, we can uh, first construct the final pullback complement, this unique up to isomorphism. Now, the idea is in order to get uh, the possible push out complements, you should pick um, factorizations of this left M morphism into uh, an M morphism A followed by an arbitrary morphism P. Then you take the push out, and if D is isomorphic to C, this is an guaranteed to be an element of the multi push out complement. And so you see, if you do this algorithmically, you only have finitely many options if A and F are finite graphs up to isomorphism. So this is uh, actually giving you an algorithm to compute this multi push out complement. You can check, it's quite a fun exercise that exactly reproduces this weird repartitioning of edges thing for the case that B is a vertex and A is two vertices. So it's this cloning thing. Okay, so that's multi push out complements. And we need, unfortunately, a much more technical construction for Sesqui push out. I, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat this. This is really a complicated construction. Uh, and and uh, actually, we thought at some point it wouldn't be possible to get a concursive theorem for Sesqui in the uh, nonlinear case simply because this is such an. Um, yeah. Anyway, so the idea is the following you, 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 you have um, a push out square. Uh, of which the vertical morphisms are an M, uh, regular monos, and the horizontal are arbitrary. And now you somehow wish to construct extensions of the square into the outer shape, which should be a, a final pullback complement, but in such a way that um, the, the left arrows are factorization into two M morphisms, and the right leg is uh, factorization and this weird shape that you, you, you have uh, uh, the M morphism of the original push square followed by an epimorphism. Um, and on top, so that, I mean, I'm sorry, this is a very technical condition, but on top such that the epi and, and this combined vertical map pulled pull back should give an identity morphism uh, between the Bs. I mean, okay, so unfortunately there is, we, we maybe this is a sign we didn't get um, massage in the best possible way, but I mean, at least the, I mean, again, you can construct these things, but um, why it is so complex, we have no idea. I mean, this is unfortunately necessary for one step in the concurrency sale. Anyway, so it's, a, it's again a universal categorical construction um, and it has good universal properties, but okay. Maybe if somebody's really interested, we should discuss later. Okay, but uh, because it's a bit dry, let's do this more practical. I think it's always good to look at what this does in practice. So let's again take our famous cloning rule and apply it to um, to a graph. You know, we attack a vertex in a graph which is linked where this vertex is linked to another vertex, and we do it in simple versus in multi graphs. Let's first do the simple graph case. So here's again this idea how to construct final pullback complements. You 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 simply take them off this extension into the classifying graph of, uh, of the one vertex graph. This just has another vertex mark with a star loop on that and, and the two possible edges that could link to this uh, original vertex. Um, and then to get the final pullback complement, you simply just uh, pull back here. 
It turns out, so in this case, this is a push out by accident in, in, in simple graph. So it's not only a final pullback component, but also a push out. Um, so that would be one simple example of a case where the original square itself is already one such augmentation, as we saw before. And then to get the push out complement elements, because there are two more, um, you, you simply factorize the, the left top um, arrow, the, the n, into a, a regular mono. So regular mono has to be edge reflecting in simple graph, followed by um, some other morphism. And you see there's two possible other solutions. However, none of these two um, has a regular mono embedding into, into the FPC object. So these are in particular not these uh, push out augmentations by final two-way complement. So that is a simple graph. Um, and yes, and, and so in, in, in multigraph, we see instead that uh, we only have, um, so basically the final polar complement is not a push out here, because if you would push this out, you would get the double edge. And you see also here two uh, push out complements. Now this time, these are actually final pull, uh, FPAs. So they are these augmentations because morphisms, any monomorphism is regular, so that, that works. Okay. And so the final construction one needs uh, in the game is so-called multi-sums. This is a uh, generalization or, or sort of in the same spirit as uh, construction by Deers on multiple limits. Um, the idea is that in all of these concurrency theorem constructions, we have uh, overlaps, so to speak, of roots encoded as co-spans of regular monomorphisms. Now, regular monomorphisms um, have the funny property, uh, if, again, you, you, you have this, um, quite a top way, that you can always factor them a co-span of regular monos into a, a, a co-span um, um, of this multi-sum element followed by a regular mono. And so one has to characterize what's the, you know, so this is a universal property, but how do you construct it? And so the idea is that as we saw earlier, uh, quasi top has has regular mono epifactorization um, and they have a strict inertial object always. So you have these finite uh, co-products of disjoint unions. Um, and so you can always factorize any morphism uh, from the from the A plus B into the uh, into the domain of the co-span uh, co domain of the co-span in in this shape. Yes. So uh, and and now the question is, we want to algorithmically produce the multi-sum elements, so the Y A Y B pairs. Um, and how do we do this? And and there's uh, a proof you can find in our paper that the way to do it is you simply search for all the M monic, regular monic uh, overlaps, push those out. So those will be elements uh, of the multi-sum. But interestingly, there's also this aspect, I mean, so the, the, the point is you, you uh, apart from the push outs, you might also can, uh, find cases where you can then further extend the push out with a so-called epimony. So in a adhesive category, those would be isomorphisms, so would not give additional contributions. But in a quasi topos uh, a, mo a monomorphism might not be regular. And so an epic mono where the mono is not regular is, is not in general, it's not an isomorphism. So these give additional contributions. And maybe just to show quickly in, in simple graphs is exactly the, un, the, the strange effect. So you can actually, if you take uh, two vertices and uh, push them out over the inter empty intersection, you get a disjoint union. You can further, of course, identify the two vertices, but there's also these epi monos into um, to where this is linked with, with one of the possible edge configurations. Okay. Ah, so I think I'm running out of time. <laughs> yes, so. please um, I'll try to come to a conclusion. Yes, okay. So, so okay, so I'm, I'm just gonna quickly show you, so for, for DPO, other than replacing uh, push-out complements with multi-push-out complements and, and, and uh, you know, uh, E-concurrent with uh, multi-sum elements, uh, this is exactly the original ARIC construction. Sorry, I'm gonna skip this. Uh, okay. Sorry, let me just try to, yes, okay. Um, yeah, uh, but for sesquilinear writing, uh, and maybe for that, I will refer you to the paper. The original def definition of direct derivation is precisely the, the one from, from, from uh, Corradini et al. Uh, but unfortunately, the rule composition is more complex. You need multi-sum elements, m proc to the right, final public complement to the left, and then push outs. And then there is a step for each rule composition. You also need to choose such an augmentation and then to sort of back propagate that in order to get the overall rule composition. So that, unfortunately, is a level of complexity for Sesqui. 
but we proofs and a full concurrency theorem for any quasi toppers. Um, yeah, and I mean, unfortunately, then let me let me skip the example. I, I'll put the sprites online, so maybe sorry, it's a bit too long. Uh, yeah, and, and I, I'm just going to skip ahead to the um, to the conclusion. So the, con the, the conclusion is that uh, we, we do have now this starting point of a com compositional theory for nonlinear rewriting. Um, we have these concurrency theorems. In double pushout case, it requires more structure, a regular monoadhesive category. We don't know why it doesn't work for quasi top A. We're working on that. But at least for adhesive categories, we have nonlinear rewriting covering this funny multigraph case. And uh, the applications, I think there, there will be many because it looks like this is especially interesting for graph generation algorithms. Um, it, it looks like a lot of things done by mathematicians, for example, graph cohomology and stuff like that. Um, but okay, so let me let me stop here and sorry for going a bit over time. Thanks.